we're past time to start, so I might as well start. Hi, everyone. Welcome. My name is Andy Trice, and um, I'm on the, I, I'm so used to calling myself a developer advocate, but I'm actually not a developer advocate anymore. But I'm on the product team for Bluemix, um, particularly working on architecture for local developer tools. But that's not always what I've done. Like I've, I've gotten to do a lot of different things as far as cloud connectivity goes, and um, especially with my role in, previously in developer advocacy, got to work on some interesting projects some of them to kind of explore what's possible and some of them transforming those explorations of what's possible into real world solutions um, across a variety, variety of different industries. And today I'd like to talk to you about specifically use cases involving IoT, and in particular flying robots, um, and Cloud Foundry and connect, combining those with cognitive computing to come up with very, very interesting use cases that can make a difference and provide value in real world situations. Um, I'm Andy Trice on Twitter, so if you want to heckle me or you know say, oh man, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about, that's fine. I'm cool with that. Uh, but let's go ahead and start with IoT. And in the most broad definition of IoT, what we're talking about is a collection of sensors and actuators that are interconnected, and so they, they work together to achieve some kind of task or solve some kind of problem. And, you know, I, I started off talking about like flying robots, uh, but, but now I'm kind of talking about more general like sensors and actuators. When we're talking about sensors, we're really talking about literally anything that's collecting information. In the case with this, we're talking about um, telemetry data, so information about the location of it, the altitude, the pitch, uh, you know, how it's flying. And we're also talking about the images that, that are being pulled off of the, the aircraft mid-flight. But while I'm talking about this particular use case, don't limit yourself to saying, oh, we're just talking about getting pictures and doing something with them. Um, th the approaches that I'm going to show you could be used for literally anything. So whether it's a, some kind of sensor that's pulling like moisture from the ground or temperature or um, infrared something, uh, I, I don't know. If you can think of a sensor that's collecting information, there's ways that it can be used in similar workflows using similar services. And when we talk about actuators, that's like the other side of it. So sensors being data coming in, actuators meaning we're doing something to perform an action, whether it's an action that you as a person are doing to change your business workflow, or whether you're using some sort of robot to go ahead and um, you know, cause some kind of action automatically based upon those, that sensor information that's coming in. And now we have to think about with all these different components, so whether it's a flying robot, whether it's a temperature sensor, whether you've got a, an array of sensors, let's say in an intelligent agriculture situation, you have sensors all over the a, a field, like you have all this information coming in from so many places, like how do you collect that information? How do you manage it? How do you make it actionable? And how do you as a user interact with that? Parts of it might be automated, parts of it might be user driven. Um, and the way that you can go ahead and uh, build these systems can be built in a, in a number of different ways. Um, you can use basically streaming analytics, uh, message queues or messaging services. Um, you can have asynchronous processing. In particular, um, you know, for IBM we have OpenWhisk, which is a serverless programming or serverless programming model, uh, which is event driven. Uh, oh, sorry, it's beeping at me up here. Um, so you have all these different options that you could use to build these kinds of an application. But what, being at Cloud Foundry Summit, I want to focus on, in particular, iterations that I've had that involve Cloud Foundry. And not just Cloud Foundry for the sake of Cloud Foundry, but using Cloud Foundry and Node.js to drive innovation. And if you're thinking about, like, well, okay, that just sounds like a lot of BS, uh, I, can, I can understand that. Uh, but, but there are distinct reasons that I've done a lot of iteration with Node.js and Cloud Foundry. Uh, Node.js itself being, it's a really easy language to get things done very quickly. Is it gonna solve every problem for every person, in every situation? Probably not, but it solves a lot of them very well. And if you're also in a situation where you need to do a lot of rapid innovation and everybody talks about like, oh, if you're gonna do something, fail fast, but let's look at the other uh, side of it. So not just failing fast, if you're going to do something, prove its value, you can do so very quickly. 
I have personally found Node.js to be a very effective tool in building these kinds of solutions to prove out concepts and say, hey, we can take this, we can make a couple changes, we can take it to the next level, and then all of a sudden we've got something that could be potentially transformative to an entire industry. And I'm gonna try and show that to you in a little bit. And talking about um, Cloud Foundry in this mix, Using the combination of Node.js and Cloud Foundry, I've been able to take my findings with uh, these IoT or physical computing based solutions and then deploy them across multiple client engagements, um, across multiple contexts, across multiple industries by just changing, taking the same thing, taking just a few different code changes, some configuration changes, pointing it at a different um, training data set for Watson services. So that's the cognitive computing part, which I'll get to in a little bit more. And then it's got an entirely different use case. And, and you know, that combination has been able to open my eyes to what's possible and open other people's eyes into building solutions uh, that, that, again, are transformative to how they're, pro they're doing their business. And um, you can see up here, I've got the drone here, and I want to focus on particularly an evolution of a use case uh, that had many, many, many iterations. So it all started, well, before I get into sort of how it started, what we're talking about in particular is this kind of an aircraft. Um, whoops, my video, did it actually play? Okay, the video is supposed to automatically play. There we go. Um, so what we're talking about are these kinds of an aircraft. There's actually two different ones there. There's literally this one uh, is the one that took off, and then another one that I have at home, the DJI Inspire one, DJI Phantom. These are commercial, um, off-the-shelf aircraft. You can get them, they have uh, SDKs, so you can build apps to interact with them so that if you wanna do programmatic flight, if you wanna be able to collect information, you wanna to respond to events like capturing media, you can do all that. And um, to some people, they think that, uh, they look at those and the first thing that they think is, hey, that's a toy, or hey, that's just for photographers, that's for videographers. But I've been using these as a hobby for probably like, in different iterations, four or five years now. And I did start with like that hobbyist photographer perspective because I was like, let's get some really cool pictures of like, um, you know, the sunset over the ocean, but looking down on all these different things, like perspectives that you can't get any other way. But it's a lot more than just a toy. Uh, here's a couple use cases, like um, some of these are from data that I've captured. Some of them are from other use cases that I'm aware of across the web, but of how these are being used to, to literally transform both industries and, and how it's being used to collect information and respond to events. So in the top left, this is actually a picture um, uh, off of Wikipedia of drone operators using it in emergency response operations in, after an earthquake in um, Southeast Asia. I can't remember the specifics of it, but I could look it up and tell you guys more if you're interested. But they're being used to, in search and rescue operations, to be able to scan and find people in a more efficient way so you can find people faster, but also safer way than sending someone into like a building that's been damaged by an earthquake because you don't want to send your rescue workers in there and have the building collapse. You can send a drone in there, look, if you find people, then you take the steps to go ahead and rescue those people. You can outfit them with thermal cameras and um, you know it's saving lives and it's transforming how people are sa uh, saving lives. On the top right, this is a digital elevation model that I created by scanning a building. Um, so doing what's called photogrammetry, where you scan it from a lot of different perspectives, and then it uses a photogrammetry software to extract information from all those, the collection of images to create 3D models. And because all the images are georeferenced based upon the metadata of the aircraft when it's flying, you can actually create georeferenced 3D models that can be used from everything from construction to um, you know different kinds of surveying, intelligent agriculture, like lots of different things. And I'll get to more about one of those scenarios in a minute. Um, this one right here is a photo that I took of a construction site, not because I was working with a construction company, but because they're building a really big building not far from me. And I was like, this is perfect for one of my talks. But um, even though this is a hypothetical use case where I'm doing this, uh, these types of techniques are being employed across industries, particularly construction industry, mining industries, to survey uh, the state of like different projects captured over time and um, be able to document things in a way that if they were using manned aircraft would be much more time consuming and much more expensive. And then this last one, uh, you might be looking at it, okay, th that's the top of a roof and there's like circles on it. Um, and this is in particular the, the use case that I will show you later, is using drones to be able to transform how 
inspections of physical structures can be done, and in particular, inspecting roofs for the presence of damage from hail, so hailstorms. Uh, so like a really bad storm rolls through, using drones and cognitive computing to automatically detect um, damage to structures. So this entire project began at um, IBM Interconnect, not this most recent one, but, but last year, and um, Actually, let me go ahead. And, uh, so it started with um, at IBM Interconnect. I had proposed a topic for one of my sessions to build a cloud-connected drone. Not doing any of the cognitive computing or anything like that, but um, just to say, hey, look, we have a drone. We're capturing data. We're pushing that up to the cloud as, and it's just to see if it's possible. Well, that session was accepted. And then I started working on a content for the keynote. Uh, and the keynote obviously took precedence. And I was working, working, working. All of a sudden, the keynote's here, the keynote's gone. And I'm like, my session's tomorrow, and I haven't started yet. But I was able to pull it off. And let me go ahead and jump over and show you the application. And then we'll talk about the process of how it was created and how it went through some, oh, come on, some very rapid iteration cycles that were empowered by this combination of Node.js and Cloud Foundry to transform the solution itself. So. Um, I've got a web interface up here. Let me go ahead and turn everything back on that I turned off earlier. They told me I'm not allowed to fly this in here. Some people want me to fly it in here. <laughs> totally could. Uh, insurance, I'm not so sure about. But um, I'll give you a live demo. Everything that I'm going to show you will be exactly the same way it would work if it were in the air. So. What I've got, I mentioned earlier that DJI provides an SDK where you can build apps that communicate with the aircraft. Um, so here on my iPad, um, let's make sure, yep, that is a live feed. Everyone's not moving all that much, so I couldn't tell. Um, but yeah, it's moving. So here on my iPad, um, I've got an app that I wrote which is communicating with the aircraft. Uh, so um, this aircraft, it'll do 4K video, um, 12 megapixel stills. It can capture data at pretty high quality. And you can gra grab all the information about it. So when you're flying it, what's its speed, altitude, the, the pitch of the camera, and all this information. And I'm capturing it. And if you guys want to see it afterwards, like up close, I'd be more than happy to show all of you. Um, so we've got all that information in here. and. Um, I'd love to show this one also. When, whenever you move the, the aircraft around and while it's flying, the camera is actually stabilized, so it's like a rock solid picture as it's flying around. So you can get really high quality imaging off of it. I'm going to go ahead and, so I just hit my button that I have here. It's capturing data. Uh, so I just took a picture, it's uploading it up to the cloud. And it's, once it gets up there, it's actually going to perform image analysis on it using the Watson Visual Recognition Service. And if you're not familiar with the Watson Visual Recognition Service, it's a cognitive service on Bluemix, which is our um, IBM's cloud platform, that you can do general classification, so saying, hey, there's people in here. It can do facial recognition. But it can also do specialized classification using what's called custom classifiers. And that's where you can train the service to look for specific things that you're, you're looking for. Um, so, you can train it to say, if I want to recognize certain patterns, specific kinds of information. Um, I'll get to a more concrete example in a minute. Um, so in that time, it captured an image. And um, oh, at this resolution, my layout gets a little bit messed up. So we can see that there's an image that was captured. We can also see the results of the Watson Visual Recognition Service. And what I find interesting about this is that it uh, recognized that we're in a building, in a hall, um, a conference room assembly hall. Uh, so it did a pretty good job, actually, at assessing where we are right now just by capturing that information um, and using the cognitive service to classify what's the content that's in here. Now, this is kind of just a cool demo to, to, to grab people's attention. And that's actually intentional. I wrote this specifically because just to grab people's attention. But I also want you to think about using this combination of technology, how you can start doing this in more complex and like real world applications. So you could be out there, you could be surveying properties. And, and let's say if you were just surveying a bunch of properties, you're capturing the data, you can be using that to classify what's the contents uh, of all these images and build an index on all of that without a single bit of user interaction other than capturing the media. And um, so if you're wondering what this weird box is on the right-hand side, I don't have a GPS signal. If I did, there would be actually a map there showing precisely where that image was captured. But let's go ahead and um, look at some images from when it was actually in the air. 
So here's an aerial photo, and you can see that it was tagged with blue sky, beach, uh, and then it's an aerial image. It's not exactly a beach, but there's sand and water in the bottom of the picture, so it's not that far off. Um, this was ca captured in real time and uh, sent up and it's uh, been pushed up for analysis. And again, if we want to go look at another example, um, so if you stop by the IBM booth and talk to Marek, uh, who's got the intelligent Roomba robot that's connected to Watson, uh, that's him. But you'll also see that the Watson Visual Recognition Service is able to extract information about people that it recognizes in there. So it can identify uh, people, gender, age, and you know, doing all this. And literally, it's just pulling data off of the, the aircraft, pushing it up to the cloud, triggering analysis. So let's jump back to my slides and kind of talk about how this evolved over time. So I said it begins with a cloud-connected drone. And the kicker here is, and I started to talk about this earlier, is I built that, the first version in literally 24 hours. And so this is where I'm saying driving productivity with Node.js, building quickly, um, and iterating quickly. Uh, you know, I had to do it quickly because I had higher priorities that took precedence, like the keynote for Interconnect. But it was one of those where, like, this is one of the coolest things. And I've been a hobby user for years, so it intrigued me, and I just got sucked in. But um, the first version was very basic. There's the app that communicates with the aircraft. That talks to Cloud Foundry. The web interface for consuming the data was on Cloud Foundry. And so it would do an HTTP uh, post to send the, the metadata with the actual image binary. And then it's storing it in Cloudant, which is a NoSQL database um, available on Bluemix. So that it's just taking it. It's, it's kind of a, a not that advanced of a system, uh, taking it in a you know, content repository. It's stuffing data in there. We can look at it. But over time, so after I got through that quick 24-hour cycle and I proved, hey, I can do this, I figure we can do a lot more than just capturing data and showing it on the web. Um, and that evolved into what we see here, which is a bit more complex, but it's much more um, reliable. And well, before I elaborate on that, let's talk about how it works now. So what you just saw is there's the app that's running on the iPad, which is plugged in the controller, talking to the aircraft, we're collecting data. That gets saved in local storage on the iPad. So this line here is identifying what's happening on the client app and what's happening up in the cloud. And this is using what's called the Cloudant Sync Framework, which is local storage for Cloudant, which implements um, the CacheDB replication protocols so that it can automatically push data up to the cloud. And Whenever I capture data, the metadata about it is being saved in here. The binary for the image is being saved as an attachment to that object. Because you might be out flying, and you're, you have no connection to the internet. So in, the case, in those cases, my other example actually would have failed miserably, because it required a persistent network connection. In this case, it's capturing the data. And whenever you get within range of uh, a network, and you, know, you could be operating off of a cell phone or operating from a SIM card that's in your iPad, whatever it might be. It will sync up to the cloud. The cloud, you know, you could have multiple instances in your cloud, so you could have replication across that. Um, but it, it's being synced up to cloud. Cloudant is automatically triggering events for OpenWhisk, which is our serverless computing platform. So all the initial processing that I was doing in Cloud Foundry, I had moved over to an OpenWhisk action, which is also based on Node.js. You can write actions in OpenWhisk in Swift, Node.js, Python, basically whatever you want. But because I started Node.js on Cloud Foundry, I could easily take that, put it into an OpenWhisk action. So as soon as data is written to the database, it kicks off the, so the serverless action, which calls the Watson Visual Recognition Service, which then does the image analysis. And then it takes it, puts it back into Cloud. And, and again, everything is running off of a web interface. And that web interface is actually the exact same one that I created for the first iteration. Now, this is a case where we, it's an interesting scenario. Um, that captures people's attention, and we, we're doing some interesting things with it. But it didn't stop there. Actually, not, not in the slightest. Um, after I did this, and the, the funny thing was I did, I did that use case and showed Watson connected drones. That actually got picked up by TechCrunch, and a bunch of people uh, approached me saying, hey, can we use this for like actual real world scenarios? And this is where I say we can use these, uh, the combination of you know, Node.js and Cloud Foundry, um, particularly with Cloud Foundry on Bluemix, where we have access to Watson and cognitive services, to start transforming industries. And I truly mean transforming industries. 
I was approached by a company, uh, not a company, a team within IBM focused on insurance solutions. And in particular, they were working with a client that wanted to be know, can we train Watson to detect the presence of one particular use case, because with, with, particularly with visual recognition services, you want to start small and build from there. And that was, can we train Watson to build, um, or not build, can we train Watson to recognize the presence of hail damage on shingle roofs? And if you look at this, how many people can look at this and point out where there's hail damage? Okay, a couple of you. But to the untrained eye, and if you don't specifically know what you're looking for, you don't know what you're looking for. I know that until people explained to me what hail damage actually looks like, I didn't know what it was. But basically, okay, it's easier to see up there too than it is on this screen, but there's small black dots and indentations. Like right there, there's a bigger one. There's a bunch right around here. There's a couple around here. The darker spots are actually areas where hail, large hail has struck the shingle roof. And um, shingle roofs, there's a layer of essentially asphalt with a granule like particulate on top of it. And when the hail impacts the roof, it knocks off the particulate, leaving these black indentations. And it turns out we were able to train Watson to recognize these specific use cases. And that's kicked off a bigger project. We're saying, what else can we tra train Watson to, um, to be able to recognize automatically? But what's also interesting about this is we didn't, Watson didn't automatically come back and say, oh, there's these certain areas that have in incidences of damage. In, instead, it was, well, can we train Watson with these small images, uh, like crop down images of just hail damage to say, is this damage or is it not damage? And then, well, what if you have a piece of uh, an image that has partial roof and partial like grass and shrubbery and all these things around it? Um, we trained Watson to be able to compare the difference between all these different pieces and then you know, chopped up the images into smaller grids and then we're using the smaller grids of images able to determine where within the image there's instance of localized damage. And that all started as a very, very, very simple application where it was like drag and drop an image from the desktop browser, drop it onto the web interface that we have here, that uploads it up to Cloud Foundry, that runs uh, graphics, map, graphics magic libraries on it from the Node.js app to chop it up into small images. We submit those to Watson Visual Recognition and we visualize the results. And that's literally the interface of what it looked like when we started. And that's the hail image that you saw just a minute ago. But, Again, earlier I mentioned how Cloud Foundry can be used to take something and uh, the, like Node.js and Cloud Foundry, you can use it for across many different use cases. And it, uh, it basically snowballed from there. So it's been used for detection uh, rust on cell towers, rust on bridges, uh, rust on high power lines, areas where there are cracks in like underground piping like for water and sewer. It's been used to identify places of damage on rail cars. And these are all real world scenarios that I've actually worked with um, client teams just to see, hey, can we just take that, retrain Watson, take the exact same code, everything that we've done, iterate on it slightly, because some of them needed, they had different requirements, different use cases, but can we take that and can we make it work for all these other scenarios? And the answer is yes. And you know how long it took me to go from this one to those other ones? Each one, including trading the data for Watson, was about four hours. So. Um, if you think about the impact that that can have on just having people visualize uh, what it can mean for their particular use cases, it, it, you know, it ended up being very powerful. But it didn't stop there. So if we go back to the insurance use case, um, we started with that and said, hey, look, we can do something really cool here. Oh, yeah. So the train, the train one was different, but um, Rust, the, there's two use cases where I use Rust and I used my data set for it, which was mine. Uh, the, by default, the visual recognition service doesn't say this is a Rust classifier or this is a hail classifier, this is some other classifier. Each IBM client owns their own training data. So they provided me with images that are positive and negative of the condition they wanted to train on and said, hey, can we make it recognize this? And so you use the visual recognition service, you train the service and the custom classifiers to be able to identify the, the different types of content that's within there. So um, does that answer? Okay. So like if I'm an insurance company A, insurance company B can't come and like start using all this stuff. 
So I, I mentioned that like, that's not where it stopped, because that particular use case, we built on top of everything that was done in that first iteration that was just analyzing those images and turned it into an actual real world um, implementation. So let's go ahead and take a look at that now. If I jump over to my browser here, and this is kind of how it evolved from that initial first proof of concept to this is a much more mature version of it, and this is actually a essentially not just proof of concept, but a functional prototype that we created with specific uh, clients in mind, where it's being operated from the perspective of an insurance adjuster, where they're going to go in, they're going to fly around a property after the, the homeowner has, has called and made a claim saying, hey, we need to check this out because I've had damage from a, from a storm. They're going to go, they're going to fly the drone around, take pictures, 50 to 100 images, images of a property, and then we're going to analyze those to see what kind of information can be extracted. And this is where I say it can be transformative to an industry because it, rather than spending half a day of an adjuster physically climbing on top of a roof, and um, you know, which is inherently unsafe, um, and also uh, time consuming and a very manual process, we can scan a property in 15 minutes, use um, the Watson services, to be able to analyze for damage. And then it can also be all kept historically so we can easily reanalyze so as we train our different pieces of, of the visual recognition service. So they come in, they upload their images from the inspection, and this is where, uh, you know, if this image might look familiar, um, we're able to come in and we can view all the images of a property and examine for incidents of hail damage. And if you look here, these little black spots are the ones that I was talking about. But it didn't stop there because th this was all based on that evolutionary set of uh, code, which is all Node.js and um, on Cloud Foundry. It, you know, it just kept snowballing. So let's say, well, what if we want to add photogrammetry, which I mentioned earlier, which is 3D object reconstruction? We've now got um, 3D point clouds that are generated from those collection of images that are available here in the web interface. And it, you know, I can not just look at a recreation of the structure, but I can also come in here, because we have all the metadata when these were captured, and start extracting measurements, because they're um, geo-referenced uh, point clouds, that are, because we have all that information captured. And we're using our processes that were set up and all orchestrated through the Node.js apps in order to be able to kick off the, these analysis processes. So um, I know I'm starting to run low on time here, so I'll try and speed it up myself. How this works now, it all started as that simple Node.js app, but that evolved dramatically. So we've still got the Node.js app running in Cloud Foundry. That's where the user is uploading their images. Those images are then being pushed off those CloudNet, and instead of using the images as attachments to CloudNet, which it was in the very first version of the application, it's being pushed to Cloud Object Storage, which is essentially an S3 compatible API for media storage, basically whatever kind of file you want that's being pushed up there. But the code for analyzing images I actually took out of Cloud Foundry because I was thinking like, well, we're doing heavy analysis on a lot of images and put that onto what's called a bare metal server on Bluemix. And that's instead of a virtualized uh, instance, it's a physical dedicated box that I have provisioned for my account. And I think I've got like 64 gigs of memory, three GPUs, because in addition to all the image uh, breaking up into smaller images, which doesn't require that much computing process, we're doing the photogrammetry operations, and that's where it's taking all those uh, images, so the 50 to 100 images, and it's starting to generate the georeference 3D models from those. And using that, um, you know, we're able to, to achieve the solution which I just showed you, but it all started through that iterative process of just taking an idea saying, hey, wouldn't it be cool if we could do this as a Node.js app? And it literally just built from there. And um, that Node.js code was partially on Cloud Foundry. Part of it moved from Cloud Foundry to an orchestration server that's running on bare metal, which is kicking off the Watson analysis, which is kicking off the photogrammetry. And again, we're pushing that back into Cloud. And, and then everything is available through a web-based interface, which is still on Cloud Foundry. And I can scale up or down instances however I need, because it's all Cloud Foundry based. And um, all the, the resources that uh, everything I've just shown you, um, there are resources for it here, and I'll tweet this out. I was Andy Trice on Twitter, uh, so that if you want to read more about it, you can definitely do so. Um, particularly Cloud Foundry apps on Bluemix, serverless functions with OpenWhisk on Bluemix, uh, bare metal servers, Kubernetes clusters, um, Watson visual recognition. The, each one of these is actually a link. 
The Skylink demo, which is the first one I showed you, which is a cloud-connected drone, I've released that as open source. So that if you want to set up your own instance of it, see how it works, you can absolutely do so just by grabbing it off of GitHub. And then um, the insurance scenario, if you'd like to learn more about that and how it works, I've got a video on there and I've got a ton of information. So if anybody wants to learn more, I'd love to be able to answer any questions that you have. So with that, I think that's my last slide. Yes, thank you. My name is Andy Trice and thanks for sticking around.